Today we're going to talk about Donald Trump fully jumping the shark and betraying how badly his campaign is doing. And I interview Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate in Florida, Debbie Mukersell Powell, about Rick Scott's abortion lies and polling showing Florida within reach for Democrats. And legal analyst Kim Whaley joins to discuss Trump's delayed sentencing and the issue of pardons as they relate to the January 6th insurrectionists. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen and you're watching No Lie. <laughs> So I know that we've all been talking about Trump for so long that nothing phases anyone about him anymore, but something's been happening over the last few weeks specifically that I think puts on full display the extent to which we've crossed the Rubicon here. Here's just a small sampling of what I mean. Can you imagine you're a parent and your son leaves the house and you say, Jimmy, I love you so much. Go have a good day in school. And your son comes back with a brutal operation. Can you, can you even imagine this? What the hell is wrong with our country? And then the press, when I say Dr. Hannibal Lecter, the press says, oh, why did he mention that? They're wise guys back there, just wise guys. They say he rambled and started talking about Hannibal Lecter. What does that have to do? That's a representative of people that are coming into our country. Dr. Hannibal Lecter, he will have you for dinner. You know that? He will have you for dinner. <laughs> that kids are transitioning genders in schools and that Hannibal Lecter is representative of immigrants coming into this country, which I suppose means that they're akin to cannibals. Look, in Donald Trump's simple mind, he assumes that the spookier he makes these warnings, the more instantly scared people are gonna be. But what he's not taking into account is that when he says insane shit like this, when he jumps the shark, no one believes him. He just decimates his own credibility. Here's the deal, if you are that easily duped by Trump, then you've already been duped by him. Not a single undecided voter is still undecided in September of 2024, only to finally be swayed when Trump says that immigrants are eating people. And so the practical effect here is the practical effect of everything Trump does, which is to double, triple, quadruple down only on his base. Again, he's not persuading anybody with these frothing claims of cannibal immigrants and kids transitioning genders in algebra class. All he's doing is further manipulating the people who are already putty in his hands, which, by the way, is a weird strategy when the goal is supposed to be expanding the coalition, not spending all of your time convincing the same people over and over and over again to vote for you even harder. In effect, all Donald Trump is doing here is putting on full display the extent to which his campaign is flailing. This is the political equivalent of just launching a Hail Mary into the end zone, which isn't something that you do when you're winning. It's what you do when you're desperate. Trump is just betraying the fact that he is so desperate. He feels so backed into a corner that he's just ramping everything up to a full 10. There's not only immigrants coming into this country, but they're eating people like Hannibal Lecter. There's not just trans people existing in America, but they're transitioning your kids in school. Everything is at its full extreme with Donald Trump. But the problem is that people don't believe things like that. It doesn't make him sound like cogent or trustworthy. It makes him sound insane. And the last thing it's doing is expanding his coalition, which again, presumably, should be the top priority of his campaign. But again, logic tends to go out the window when you were running on pure desperation, and that's what's happening to Trump right now. So look, yes, Trump is dangerous, and the things that he says will continue to radicalize the suckers who believe him. But aside from that, the fact is that Donald Trump is continuing to put on full display that far from acting from a place of strength, he's acting from a place of extreme weakness. He is desperate and flailing and increasingly unhinged. He knows that he's losing this race, which is why every word out of his mouth is more extreme than the last. The difference is that far from captivating this country, similar to what happened in 2016, he's really just coming across as tired and pathetic. Trump has found a lot of virtue in being perceived as a strong man up to this point, but now it's hard to see him as anything other than just straight weakness. Here are previews of my interviews with Debbie Mukersell Powell and Kim Whaley. Um, I do want to switch our attention to some big news out of Florida. Uh, the Emerson poll just released on Friday shows Rick Scott at 46% and you at 45% with 9% of respondents undecided. That would suggest then, to your earlier point, that Florida is actually in, in play. So what do you say to folks who've written off Florida? Well, they're not paying attention is what I, what I say to them. And look, that poll is just one of many polls that have shown that I'm basically tied with Rick Scott at this point. And, and here's what I want people to understand. We haven't even been on TV yet. We're just starting 
our, our communications plan. We have, we've been very strategic. We've been using the limited funds that we have to communicate with voters. We have been building a grassroots movement and people in Florida are rejecting the extreme policies that have been coming out uh, from Washington DC by Rick Scott, by people like Rick Scott, but, but mostly from Tallahassee, right? I mean, people here are tired of the attacks against education, banning books, taking away the freedom, the freedom for people to be able to make a good living in the state of Florida. We have an affordability crisis here. People can't pay their mortgage, their rent, their insurance rates. They can't can't afford uh, to send their children to to school or or pay for their for students that go into our public universities. It's becoming so unaffordable, and now they're taking away a woman's right to choose. And so, uh, Floridians have been organizing. We have been building a grassroots campaign, and it showed in the primary, the solid primary win that we had just a couple of weeks ago. And now you're seeing a poll where people now, when they know that they have a choice. They come to us very quickly. They don't want to vote for Rick Scott. They're done with his policies. And that's why people need to pay attention because we can win the seat and we need to keep the Senate majority. Donald Trump's New York sentencing was delayed until after the election. There seems to be two schools of thought on this. The first is that Donald Trump got away with it yet again because he always does. And the second is actually a little bit more nuanced, which the internet is famous for accepting. And that is that this actually unencumbers Judge Mershon to then impose a sentence of incarceration if he's not burdened by the prospect of impacting a presidential election, which we now know is something that weighs into his into his uh, uh, decision making here. So where do you where do you land on this issue? Well, if there's a sentencing date, he didn't get away, get away with anything, just not for now. And I, I'm kind of in camp number two. Uh, first of all, we know from the Justice Department, of course, this is a state law pr prosecution. Uh, we know that there's a 60 day limit on starting new new investigations. And so there's a recognition that things close to an election is probably something that the criminal justice system should stay away from. But honestly, you know, reportedly, he Trump raises so much money when there's anything that happens in these in these trials. So imagine Mershon wants to impose a sentence and then he's got, he not only is going to raise a lot of money, he's going to grab all the attention of the news cycle. Uh, so merchan has got to know it's going to divert the conversation uh, away from the election and the issues because Donald Trump is brilliant at that. And from my perspective, he's kind of been flailing since Kamala Harris took over the nomination. He hasn't really gotten any traction on anything other than, you know, the stumbles of his VP candidate. What do you say to Republicans who now claim that Judge Mershon saying, uh, staying the sentencing until after the election validates their claims that this is indeed election interference? Because why else would he not have imposed a sentence if not for the fact that an election was upcoming? Well, I mean, they're masters of heads. We win, tails you lose. <laughs> right. You right. Know, so, so I, you know, I can't imagine if he did do it before, then it would just be you know, a ticker tape parade for them because they'd actually have something to point at him. I mean, to say that the delay is somehow nefarious, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think, you know, people do want to see justice for Donald Trump. And, uh, you know, the Supreme Court has just handed him win after win after win in ways that I think are deeply, deeply troubling and uh, maybe even contrary to the plain language of the Constitution. So that's really the bigger problem in my mind. I think that the wheels will hum along in New York as they have. That was the case everybody thought should not have been brought. That was the weakest case. And I think that's the one that's going to end up with a sentence, uh, whether he's president or not. And of course, to see the full interviews with Debbie and Kim, click the thumbnails right here on the screen or check out the interviews playlist on my YouTube channel. You can also click the link on the screen to listen to the audio version of this episode. And of course, to see more of my content, the subscribe button's on the screen as well.